My name is Lindsay O'Neill, and I am with Today News Africa, speaking today with Ms. Yukari Watani Kane and Ms. Shaheen Pasha. I would like to start with um, Ms. Kane. Could you first introduce yourself, explain a little bit about what Prison Journalism Project is, um, and what have you been noticing about inmate experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, so uh, the Prison Journalism Project is um, an initiative that uh, trains and works with incarcerated and formerly incarcerated journal uh, writers and, and in the tools of journalism. And, uh, and then we help them reach a mainstream audience through our own publication, as well as through partnerships with uh, other media organizations. And, uh, and so we um, launched our publication about a year ago when the pandemic started because uh, we thought that uh, the voices from inside should be part of the historical record. And, um, and to date we've published uh, over 500 stories from 200 writers across 28 states uh, in the US plus Canada. Um, and, uh, and they've written about everything from COVID to Black Lives Matter and life in prison, prison conditions, et cetera. Um, and so um, in terms of COVID, um, you know, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of the trends we've seen in the US um, are also seen in prison, but just with um, deeper consequences and, and, um, and, and more serious consequences. And so, uh, you know, there've been a number of outbreaks in prisons across the country um, and uh, they've really, uh, grappled with, uh, first of all, getting um, protective equipment um, like masks, um, hand sanitizers, I'm not sure even, you know, are even uh, part of the equation. Um, they're just having trouble getting soap and staying clean, um, for example. Um, I think there's, there's a, a feeling really across the board that we've seen that prison is actually a closed environment. And so it should keep them safe as long as outsiders are safe. And, um, and there's a sense that uh, they haven't been safe. You know, they've, uh, they've reported correction officers who have not worn masks or who are too close or who come in sick, et cetera, who, um, you know, who, who shake hands um, or uh, just not being safe. And that's been causing a lot of distress uh, because, you know, it puts them at danger and they really can't do anything about it. And then, and then secondly, there's a, been a big um, deep mental health impact because visitations have been canceled. And so uh, a lot of our writers have not seen their family in person for a year now. And uh, they're wondering if visitations are going to come back. And so it's, um, it's everything we feel out here, um, they feel more deeply and, um, and, and often with more serious consequences. Thank you. Um, Miss, uh, Miss Pasha, could you introduce yourself as well and elaborate um, on the prison system as a whole since COVID, has any changes in regulation happened? Has there been an approach to, um, you know, uh, work with inmates? Has that differed since the pandemic? And any anything that you wanted to elaborate on with Ms. Kane, with my, what Ms. Kane said? I think when you're talking about the prison system um, across the country, you're going to find that it's not one system. You have literally every individual prison, jail, detention facility kind of doing things in their own way. I mean, so in some prisons, they are, you know, have been a little bit stricter in terms of um, keeping people apart or, or at least making the effort to do so. In others, it's that's not even an issue. That's if everybody's in, you know, and there's an absolutely no sort of testing, you know, some prisons right now have already started vaccinating um, the incarcerated men and women inside other prisons that's they're the last on the list to happen. So I think what this really reflects is just how disjointed um, the mass incarceration system here is in the United States. It runs state by state, county to county. Oftentimes, you know, the prisons are doing their own thing and, you know, state guidelines may be completely different. And so what happens is, um, 
a lot of times though, you know, our men and women do write us and tell us about, you know, things that have, you know, that they feel violate policies, but they don't really have many channels to, to go through, to be able to have any sort of, um, means of fixing those things. So I think in terms of trying to figure out the prison system, it really is just a moving target. I mean, they're doing, every prison is doing its own thing. And the incarcerated population is just trying to keep up and make sure that they are not forgotten in the midst of all of this. Mm -hmm. And um, so back to you, Ms. Kane, um, you, you spoke on that there is that um, attitude of um, prison guards not wearing masks or still being around um, inmates and possibly, you know, continuing the spread. Has that changed the dynamic? Has um, the dynamic um, improved or is there a sympathetic attitude? Um, has it pretty much been the same before the pandemic and after? What is that relationship like between guards and inmates um, and administrators as well? You know, it's, um, it runs the gamut really depending on where the prison is located and, um, and the culture of, of prisons, even within the state, I think uh, prison to prison, it can be different, but on the whole, there is um, a power dynamic. And so uh, I think, um, you know, while it's, you can't, it's, it's really hard to generalize and say all, you know, all corrections officers, for example, are bad. Um, there is, um, there's always the uh, you know abuses of power or uh, you know weird um, bad power dynamics, and I think that's only been exacerbated in uh, in COVID uh, times because uh, you know depending on on where individuals are in terms of of uh, how much uh, how safe safe they stay. You know, right now out here we already have uh, we have different people who won't wear masks, who don't think COVID is that serious, who uh, won't get vaccinated, others who will. And so there's always this, this um, clash of, of, of positions. Um, and so, you know, we've had a few stories by writers who say that uh, they've been penalized for doing something to try to stay safe for trying to make masks out of um, other material when they don't have them, for example. Um, and so there's, um, I think it's, it's very tense, uh, you know, and then, and then the mental health issues has exacerbated the tensions. Um, and so I think now as the vaccinations are rolling out, some of the, the questions that are, that are coming up is, um, you know, idea, ideally, it's it's safer for everybody if if everybody gets vaccinated. But um, you know, it's it's not something that you can force on people. So you you have prisons with varying amounts of of vaccination rates. And then um, as but as things normalize, uh, there are a lot of questions and concerns about how quickly and how much programming will resume and programming and visitation. And so there's a fear that some of the rollbacks that have happened because of the pandemic will stay in place. Interesting. Um, yeah, there was just recently an Associated Press article that discussed a lot of um, corrections officers are opting out of taking the vaccine for um, a variety of reasons. Um, I was wondering if Ms. Pasha, you could elaborate on why that apprehension is happening um, and when you foresee COVID-19 um, vaccines being administered through um, a larger portion of the prison population themselves, not just the corrections officers. Yeah, I mean, I think it, a lot of the concerns that you're seeing towards taking the vaccinations inside or what, you know, are outside people see it as something that's been kind of, you know, rushed through, you know, we don't fully understand what, um, you know, what, the repercussions may be, what the side of longer term side effects may be. And so you do have um, within the prisons, when it comes to the corrections officers and some of the administrators, they, you know, they have concerns, but they, they don't want to be guinea pigs. and They don't want to do that. Very similar to, you know, what we're seeing outside. But what we're also seeing is that there is this distrust of um, vaccines and, and medical and certain, you know, medical treatments from the incarcerated people because you know they're, they've been, had a history of being abused and tested on and and different things so they don't 
they're not all comfortable with um, getting the vaccines either. So it really is a lot of the same challenges that we are seeing outside, you know, our, our inside. It also, where are you receiving your news from? You know, do, do administrators, you know, believe in vaccines or don't they? I mean, these are all things and that's going to impact whether it's allowed in and how it gets administered inside and the information that the incarcerated people are receiving of the vaccines, which is going to make you know them question whether they should take it. So you see a lot of um, confusion inside. And I want to really emphasize that prison is not made to handle a pandemic. I mean, by default, by design, it is impossible to curb it. There's no way to safely socially distance. There is no way for people to um, you know, use like, cause there's not enough supply of masks to be able to use masks. As Yukari said, there's, you know, hand sanitizers are considered security, if, you know, issues because you can make different things with them, alcohol or whatever. So there's a lot of um, things just by the mere design of prisons um, that make it hard to curb a pandemic. You add any kind of misinformation or lack of information coming in about uh, vaccines and the potential side effects. And there is a lot of distrust that you're gonna find within. Um, and that is kind of across the board what we're seeing. Some people are willing to take the risk, but a lot, I mean, a lot of the prisons we're looking at, there is a, a fear inside that I don't want to wind up dying from something that's been untested and I don't want to be the guinea pig for it, so I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. Right, and that has like a nationwide impact, um, not just an individual system, uh, individual prison um, impact. Um, Ms. Kane, do you, have you observed any positive changes um, since the pandemic? Have you noticed any particular prisons or correctional facilities that have made um, some positive changes that have maybe adapted better than others? Um, something that could be hopeful for the future to be able to adapt to a, to a scenario like this again? Oh uh, gosh, uh, I I can't say that that I have. Um, you know, one of the the more uh, progressive prisons in the country is San Quentin State Prison in California um, in terms of programming and 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 things like that. But um, but they had one of the worst outbreaks in in the country, and so um, you know it's. Um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, one of the, well, I will say that one thing that San Quentin is doing, um, and and our writers might have opinions about how how good it is, but it still I think is impressive nonetheless. Is um, they the prison issues a, a newsletter for for the incarcerated population with um, the latest statistics for COVID cases, et cetera. It's called the informed patient and it's a monthly newsletter. And the fact that that exists at all, I think um, is, is probably remarkable um, given this, the state of, of incarceration in this country. Um, I will say that um, just around me, uh, the, I, I'm, I'm based in Illinois and um, I teach at Northwestern University, which has uh, a Northwestern prison education program. And they have remarkably been able to carry on their, um, their four credit college classes at Stateville Correctional. And, um, and there's a very elaborate s system of uh, somebody going in twice a week, wants to pick up uh, completed coursework and wants to drop off completed coursework. And um, it's, that's also um, pretty remarkable. So there are, I think where there are um, examples of um, some remarkable initiatives, um, a lot of that is happening around universities in this country and university affiliated prison programs where they're really, they've, they've really worked hard to make sure that their students are not left completely in the lurch. Right. Um, and that brings me to the final piece. Where can our viewers learn more about the Prison Journalism Project, get involved, um, share it on social media? 
Yeah, the Prison Journalism Project, um, you can check out our stories on uh, prisonjournalismproject.org. If you go on the website, we have a fantastic section there um, for anyone that's interested in volunteering. Um, we do uh, every four to six weeks, we do uh, different volunteer trainings where we take people from transcribers to editors and kind of teach them how to take this material that we're receiving, largely handwritten material from around the country and, and Canada, to how to be able to get that in a place where we can publish it. Um, in terms of social media, we are on all the major platforms. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. And yeah, I mean, I really hope people will check it out. I mean, it's one of those things that we're all silenced right now in many ways and isolated. And I think that that is even more so when you talk about the incarcerated population. So it really does help when people check out their stories, read about what's happening inside so that they're not completely forgotten during this time. I was just going to say we're also an all volunteer run organization. And so um, if um, you know anybody would like to support us, um, every dollar counts. Well, this is great. I've learned a lot. And I think our viewers have learned a lot about the program. Um, thank you again, Miss uh, Yukari Yubatani Kane and Miss Shaheen Pasha, both co founders, Prison Journalism Project. And my name is Lindsay O'Neill with today's Today News Africa. Thank you both for your insights on this critical issue.